For me, Intramuros is a place of history. Um, it is a cultural and creative hub, and um, it brings so much pride and joy to the 5th District as well. If I could describe Intramuros in one word, it's mesmerizing because walking along or walking around, it gives you a sense of history and makes you step into a whole new world that is so different from what you see outside the walls of Intramuros. My fondest memories of Intramuros, I would say, was when I was a little girl because I also grew up here in the 5th district and as a little girl, I would come to Intramuros with my parents, I would tag along, I would ride the Kalesa, I would go around Intramuros, Fort Santiago, and I would remember also coming to Barbaras to eat with my dad. Hi, my name is Crystal Bagat Singh. I am currently the Congresswoman of the 5th District of Manila, where Intramuros is located. One of my advocacies is um, about culture, preserving culture, and uh, one of the things that I also do as a congresswoman is make legislation, and I also have a constituency inside Intramuros. I think it's very important because when you say Metro Manila, there is really no place to go to for a cultural experience or for a historical experience. And there's really no other place like Intramuros. It's, it's, a, it's an original. There's nothing like it. If you want to have a feel of how it was to live during the Spanish times, this is where you go. I wish that everybody would work together to keep Intramuros the way it is, but make it better, preserve it better. It was a very exciting time, that's what I remember most. I was on a holiday and I got a frantic call. Where are you anyway? They have been looking for you. And I said, what about? Having a restoration force as big as Intramuros was at the time, well, that didn't exist anywhere in the country. When we came into Intramuros to work, uh, what are we restoring? We do not know how did it look except for the ruined walls. That's why we have to to dig pictures and pictures and pictures just to be able to to provide a background uh, and tell people this is important. This part of the walls look like this. Everything was something that came to us by a calling, you'd say, that we have to do it right. Intramuros is a beautiful memory of the past. It is like a microcosm of all things good and bad. There are many good stories about Filipinos, people who headed the construction of the walls, and they were Indios. The carvers were Filipinos also. The people should follow the regulations more, and that they should not seek exemption all the time. And this applies to both government church and private owners. Ang Esperanza Bunag Katungton, I was hired, I would say, I was one of the first employed in the Intramuros administration structure, and that was pretty. 1979, 
You have many people saying that Intramuros should not be preserved because it is a colonial memory and that should be erased. I don't think so. It represents failure. It represents achievement. So it's about time that our people should see Intramuros is not just a symbol of colonialization, but a symbol of our spirit to rise above. For me, Intramuros is our past, present, and our future. And because of that, it is very important in our lives. We must be involved and engaged in Intramuros. And we, as citizens, must do everything to keep it alive, to keep it vibrant, because it is the archive of our history. It is the archive of who we are as a people. I'm Olivia Limpeao. I'm the president and CEO of Distillery Limtuaco and the fifth generation master blender and distiller of the oldest distillery in the Philippines. So our company was established in 1852 and it was our founder is uh, Don Bonifacio Limtuaco who came from China, Fujian, China, and he introduced to the Philippines this product called Shok Hok Tong, which eventually became the generic term uh, for Chinese medicinal wine, Shok Tong. And so uh, we are very much part of the history of the Philippines through our liquor making with 167 years of history and legacy that we have shared with this country. Well, Intramuros is very important because this was really the seat of um, governmental power and uh, trade culture, religion, and we're very proud to be part of Intramuros now through our museum. While our role in Intramuros is really to provide another tourist spot, you know, another tourist spot where through our museum, tourists can learn more about our country, about our products, about our industry. And uh, we're very proud to be given that opportunity to participate, you know, in promoting culture through food. Well, I would really love that Intramuros would be teeming with tourists, with young people working in this place, celebrating our history and our culture, and sharing it with the rest of the world similar to what other countries are doing. For instance, like in Tallinn, Estonia, where they have a medieval, medieval walled city. I wish uh, our Intramuros would be not just like that, but maybe even better, you know? So it would be um, really a living walled city of the past, the present, and the future.
Hello po, Sir Ferdinand. Good afternoon din po. By the way, John. Yes. Did you hear some background noise just now? Yeah, I, I hear construction there. Okay. Is it very loud? Yeah, we can manage. We can manage. I can close the door. Maybe uh, better I close the door. Yes, please. Hello, Ms. Maylene. Good afternoon din po. Okay, so we are going to start now. So uh, welcome everyone to the 40th episode of the Intramuros Learning Session. So this is now our 40th. Can you imagine that it's uh, 40th na for this year? Uh, so let's end the year with a bang with our topic with uh, Eric Aquidon later. So this episode is brought to you by the Intramuros Administration and this is your host, Rancho Arcelia. And now, uh, before we proceed, I'd like to show first some house rules. Now, if you are viewing via Zoom, please raise your questions in the Q&A button below. And for Facebook viewers, you may raise your, uh, you may raise your, uh, sorry. You may raise your questions in the comment section below. Only those who have successfully registered and viewed on Zoom will be eligible to get a certificate and a feedback form will be emailed to you after the session and a certificate will be sent within a week. And note that this webinar is recorded. And the recording shall be made permanently available in IA's social media channel. Uh, we are very fortunate to have today as speaker, Mr. Eric Akpedono. Eric teaches art, appreciation, and architectural history and colonial art and architecture at the Ateneo de Manila University. He studied architecture at the Leap University of Applied Science in Detmold, Germany. And as a research associate at the Ateneo Institute of Philippine Culture, Eric has been conducting extensive surveys of historic Philippine architecture in Bohol, as well as in Metro Manila as project manager of the Architectural Heritage of Manila project 1571 to 1960. He has published extensively on architecture, urbanism and culture and is co-author of the book, Casa Boholana, Vintage Houses of Bohol 2011. Uh, now we proceed to our presentation. Uh, Eric, whenever you're ready. Ready to go, John. Thank you so much for the introduction. Okay. Okay, I think I'll be sharing my screen now. Okay, I hope you can all see the screen. Is that clear there? Yes, it is very clear. All right, great. Well then, uh, thank you for coming to this uh, 40th Intramuros Learning Session. Uh, we'll be talking today about history writing, uh, not in the usual way as you would normally imagine history writing to take place with pencil and paper, but rather in a far more efficient way, namely with bombs and bulldozers. And we'll be touching on issues of built heritage and identity and built heritage and conflict because the two are very closely interrelated. So do not think that history writing is an academic uh, affair. It is something very real and has very real consequences for architecture, for heritage, but in particular for the people who belong to this heritage. Mm -hmm. 
When we talk about heritage, we always have to look at how heritage is interpreted by different stakeholders. And who is actually the owner of that heritage? The no? question is always, whose heritage are we talking about? So we have to look at the stakeholders at different times and on different social levels, no? because heritage is a matter both related to class as well as ethnicity and other uh, group markers. Uh, Eric, is it okay to full screen the slides? Uh, sorry, what do you mean, John? Is it okay if we enlarge the slides to full screen? Okay, we can. If I do not, just let me see. Where do we do that? Uh, okay. There's a button there, there. This one. Okay, we have it. Is it okay now? Yes. All right. Um, Okay, so heritage can be controversial. It is a source of conflict throughout human history, has always been, and architecture in particular, because architecture is highly visible. No? It's impossible to be ignored. And therefore, it always has an ideological component, which heavily depends on the local or national interpretation. And this kind of uh, ideological component of heritage, and especially of built heritage, can be subtle. And sometimes it is very obvious no? and basically jumps you into the eye. But most important to remember is that interpretation of heritage and built heritage in particular is never static. It changes over time. How we pursue heritage today may be different how we pursued or how we interpreted heritage in the past and will again be different how we will interpret that heritage in the future. It shifts all the time depending on political and cultural circumstances. And this kind of uh, interpretation and evaluation is subject to constant discussion and re-evaluation. As I said, interpretation of heritage is not moot and academic, but has very real consequences for existing heritage structures, as well as for the people. Um, when we talk about conflicting interpretation, uh, I think the Temple Mount in Jerusalem very much represents in an almost perfect way this conflict, conflicting interpretations of heritage and how they are used to justify control of land, of power, of ideology. You know? We all know the Temple Mount, we all know Jerusalem. We know that this is the holy site for three world religions. No, it is holy for the Jews because this was the site of the original Jewish temple. Although nobody really knows where exactly the holiest of holy used to be located on the mountain. Which, by the way, is one reason why Jews are actually, even if they were allowed access to the top of the mountain, wouldn't actually go there because to avoid accidentally stepping on the area where the altar used to be. What still remains of the temple today is the so-called Western Wall or the Wall of Mourning, you know? the only remaining part of the original temple that was destroyed by the Romans. There are actually groups among Jewish uh, citizens of the extreme type who actually ask for the re-erection of the Jewish temple that was destroyed almost 2000 years ago which of course would include the destruction of the currently existing Islamic monument. The site of course is also holy for the Christian you know, because uh, an important part of the life of Jesus Christ played out in Jerusalem. You know? Think of the story of the cleansing of the temple. Think of the story of Jesus' arrest, trial and crucifixion on Golgotha in Jerusalem. And also the Temple Mount has been the site of a Christian church before it became an Islamic holy site. And then, of course, what we see today is Islam. Uh, Jerusalem is the third holiest site of Islam because this is the Temple Mount in particular, because this is where Muhammad ascended to heaven. And this is the site of the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Moshe, Al -Aqsa Mosque, which are among the oldest religious buildings of Islam. And so it is also of immense importance to Muslims. Third most holiest site after Mecca and Medina. So all of those three religions have major claims to the Temple Mountain. And heritage, 
plays out here as openly and as uh, clearly as probably nobody else in the world. So when we talk about ideology, religion, identity and conflict, we will be looking at a few different aspects of how these conflicts play out and what role heritage and built heritage in particular plays in there. We'll be discussing ethnic cleansing and the role of heritage. We'll be talking about iconoclasm and the erasure of memory. We'll talk about class struggle and how it affects heritage. We will see how heritage has been used to glorify a dictatorship and how it is being used in the past and in the present to reassert national identity in various countries. And we will see how heritage is a major factor in, uh, or rather the interpretation of heritage is a major factor in how war destroyed cities are to be rebuilt and in what shape. Okay, without much ado, let's uh, start with the first one, ethnic cleansing and the role of built heritage. Ethnic cleansing is basically a term that uh, uh, describes the systematic driving away of indigenous populations and their replacement with uh, members of a different ethnic or religious or racial group. Uh, the example we'll be using here is the, or are the civil wars of Yugoslavia, which played out between 1991 and 2001. I'm not saying civil war, but actually civil wars, because it was actually a series of uh, various conflicts, which played out in sequence. Uh, the Yugoslav civil wars were triggered in the early 90s by the rise of nationalism. You know, the country of Yugoslavia was uh, um, a semi, well, a socialist country, ruled by the iron fist of uh, Marshal Tito, the president of Yugoslavia. And when he died, uh, nationalism, which had been suppressed under his regime, emerged in all parts of the country, especially in Serbia, though. And this uh, rise of extremist nationalism in 1991 led to several of the former provinces of Yugoslavia declaring independence. And this triggered the civil war. And in the civil war, various ethnic groups tried to gain dominance over certain regions of Yugoslavia. And by doing so, driving away the indigenous populations, uh, systematically replacing them with members of their own uh, ethnicity or nationality, and systematic destruction, systematic widespread and deliberate destruction of the cultural markers of that other uh, rival, uh, group that has been driven away. So here we have Yugoslavia uh, on the Balkans facing the Adriatic Sea. This is how it looked like before it fell apart in 1991. And when we look at the map of uh, Yugoslavia, we will see that it is really a mishmash of different, very different ethnic and religious groups. Uh, we look uh, to the north, we see Slovenia. Uh, this is a Slavic people, Roman Catholic, uh, who occupy what today is known as uh, Slovenia. Then to the south, we have the Croats. Croats are likewise uh, a Slavic people and uh, uh, belonging to the Roman Catholic religion. However, the largest group in Yugoslavia were the Serbs, here marked in red, which are not uh, Catholic, but rather Orthodox, Orthodox Christians, and to occupy, well, the province of Serbia, but also have uh, settlements in Bosnia and in uh, um, Croatia. Then we also have uh, people of Montenegro who are closely related to the Serbs. And in the South, we have Macedonians, as well as Albanians who live in what uh, today is known as the Kosovo. And you can imagine from this uh, patchwork of uh, ethnic groups of different religions. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention, most importantly, in the center of Yugoslavia, you have Muslims. The Muslims are also uh, ethnically Slav. They speak a Slavic language, but their religion is Islam. And so you have Roman Catholics, you have Muslims, you have Orthodox Christians, 
uh, all uh, set against each other. I forgot to mention Albanians are also uh, primarily Muslim. So when the civil war erupted, each of those groups tried to seize control of territory. And this had significant impact on the built heritage of each of the groups involved in this conflict. Uh, one of the first acts of war was that the capital of Bosnia, uh, the province in the center of Yugoslavia, was surrounded by Serbic, by Serb forces and was put under a three-year siege. Um, what we see here is the National Library in Sarajevo, which was built in 1894 in a sort of a Moorish, neo-Moorish style, you know, resembling the Turkish architecture. We have to know that uh, uh, Bosnia has been a province of the Ottoman Empire for many centuries. So the building reflects this uh, Turkish Ottoman heritage. Sarajevo itself was mixed, uh, inhabited by Muslims, uh, Catholics, as well as by Orthodox Christians. But when war broke out, okay, we are, here we have an interior shot of the library. When war broke out, the city was surrounded by Serb forces who started shelling the city. And one of the buildings that was deliberately shelled was the library of Sarajevo. You can actually see a video on YouTube about this, how the library was bombarded and subsequently burned out entirely, entirely destroyed. Now you might ask why do military forces bombard a library which has zero military value. You know, there were no enemy forces there. Well, for a simple reason. The library stood for something that the attackers wanted to destroy. The library was a symbol of a time when Sarajevo was a multi-racial, multi-ethnic city, a multi-religious city, where Serbs, Croats, and Bosnians lived peacefully side by side during the time of the Ottoman Empire, as well as the time of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So this is a memory of a different past when the nationalism was actually not the dominant force, but rather the cosmopolitan life of Sarajevo before war broke out. And it was this uh, heritage, this memory of a pluralistic cosmopolitan past that was deliberately destroyed. Very successfully though, the building burned down with it destroying almost 2 million copies, including many rare and precious volumes. Another important landmark that fell victim to the Yugoslav civil war was the bridge of Mostar. Now in uh, Sarajevo, we had uh, Serb forces pitted against uh, Muslim forces who held the city of Sarajevo. Here in Mostar, uh, on the boundary between Bosnia and Croatia, we have uh, Muslim forces pitted against Croats. Uh, a little bit of background, the city of Mostar before the war was inhabited peacefully by both uh, Muslims and Croats. And the symbol of that uh, shared heritage is the bridge of Mostar that we see here uh, in the 1980s. The bridge itself is one of the famous landmarks of Yugoslavia. It was built in uh, 1556 to 1566 by Mimar Sinan, Mimar means architect, a famous architect of the Ottoman Empire. You know, it was very famous, a very keen destruction, uh, construction. And it was because of this immense uh, symbolic value of the bridge that it was uh, deliberately targeted and shelled by Croat forces in 1993. So it was subjected to systematic artillery fire over several hours. Again, it had zero military value. It was not uh, any uh, structure that was uh, relevant for the war. It was deliberately shelled in order to destroy it in what uh, the historian Andras Riedelmeier termed the destruction, uh, the destruction as an act of killing memory, yeah, in which evidence of a shared cultural heritage and peaceful coexistence were deliberately destroyed. Now, the same thing that we saw playing out in Sarajevo, repeated here in Mostar. 
Here again, we have a, a video on YouTube. You can watch, it's very instructive, how it came about and how the bridge was ultimately also rebuilt. So here we have the bridge shortly after the destruction, uh, covered over with a preliminary provisorical bridge, but ultimately the bridge was reconstructed. And very much as the destruction was an attempt to erase the memory of uh, peaceful cohabitation, of Islam and Christianity, as much the reconstruction of the bridge was a deliberate attempt to reconnect, to reestablish this memory of a more pluralistic and non-nationalistic Yugoslavia and Mostar. So the bridge was reconstructed starting already during the war in 1995, completed in 2004. And uh, it's not only the bridge that was uh, reconstructed, but also an ancient tradition, more than 300 years old, was revived, the so-called traditional bridge jump, whereby men would be jumping from the bridge once a year, 20 meters high, and the most elegant diver would win a prize. And uh, anybody can participate, whether you're Muslim, whether you're Croat, whether you're Serb, no, it's free for all, and the winner will be awarded. So again, a uh, ritual that all of the citizens of Mosta share in, and a reminder of the pluralistic and cosmopolitan history of the city. Um, in the course of the war, Serb troops tried to occupy much of uh, Muslim land in central Bosnia, and in doing so drove away much of the indigenous Muslim or Bosnian population of central Bosnia. You probably heard about the massacre of uh, Srebrenica, which was one of those acts of uh, ethnic cleansing by Serb forces, whereby 8,000 young men were systematically murdered. And in line with that went the deliberate destruction of Muslim heritage in the center of Bosnia. And why would uh, Serb forces destroy religious buildings. Well, for one thing, religious buildings, whether churches, mosques, or whatever, are usually prime targets in uh, campaigns of ethnic cleansing. Religious buildings and most importantly, cemeteries. You know, cemeteries are targeted because cemeteries are witnesses and are evidence of century old claims of the indigenous population to this land. You know? The cemetery proves my ancestors have been living here for hundreds of years. Here are buried my father, my grandfather, my great great grandfather. So I also have a right to live here. And that is why cemeteries are very prime targets when it comes to ethnic cleansing. They are desegregated. Sometimes even coffins are dug up, bones are thrown around. It's very messy. It happens repeatedly when we talk about ethnic cleansing. And in line with that, you destroy the cultural markets, especially their religious buildings, of the population that is to be driven away. Take, for example, here the Ferhat Pasha Mosque in Banja Luka, built in the 15th, uh, 16th century and deliberately blown up by Serbian troops in 1993 as they tried to clear the area, area of uh, its uh, Muslim population. And here again, as we have seen in other parts of uh, the former Yugoslavia, uh, systematic efforts were made after the war to reconstruct this destroyed heritage. Now in a counter move to reestablish the claim of the population that was driven away to reestablish their claim to live in these ancestral lands of theirs. So the Ferhat Pasha Mosque was reconstructed in uh, 2014 with help of the European Union. In fact, in Banja Luka, this act of uh, deliberately destroying cultural built heritage is not a new thing. It already happened during World War II. In World War II, it was actually the Croats pitched against the Serbs. And uh, at that time, uh, Banja Luka was under the control of uh, fascist uh, Croat forces, the so-called Ustasha, and in their drive to uh, drive away the local Serb population, they destroyed their church, the Cathedral of the Holy Trinity, which was blown up in 1941. 
And here again, it was rebuilt uh, after the war to reestablish the right of the Serbs to live in Banja Luka. So this has a long tradition, apparently. Now, if you think that it is only the Serbs who have been committing acts of uh, cultural desecration, think again. Uh, in the last phase of the Yugoslav civil wars, we saw an uprising of the uh, Albanian population of the Kosovo, uh, which was answered by Serb forces with, the, um, with attempts of ethnic cleansing, as well as systematic destruction of Muslim Albanian heritage. But then uh, Albanians struck back and began a campaign of systematically destroying the cultural markers and witnesses of the indigenous Serb population. So Orthodox churches were systematically torched, blown up, set on fire, like here the St. Elijah Church in, uh, in the Kosovo, or the Serbian Orthodox Cathedral of St. George in Prizren was set on fire by Albanians in 2004. And here again, after the war, we see that uh, even though Kosovo was now separated from Serbia, it became a country in its own right, deliberate attempts were made to systematically reconstruct the destroyed heritage in order to reassert the claim of the indigenous population to its ancestral lands. Like here, the Devich Monastery in Kosovo from the 15th century, which was also destroyed in 2004 and has since been reconstructed in its original form. So the cycle of construction, destruction, reconstruction, all in the name of claiming your right to the ancestral land of your forebears. So for the later discussion, I've prepared a few uh, pages. Can you think of similar examples in Asia or in the Philippines? And perhaps another question that we may discuss later, by reconstructing destroyed buildings, are we not also falsifying or manipulating history, like pretending that the destruction never happened? Is it not as much manipulation of history as the systematic destruction of built heritage? Okay, we're coming to the next uh, topic, iconoclasm. You've probably heard about this before. Iconoclasm, the social belief in the importance of the destruction of icons and other images or monuments, most frequently for religious or political reasons. Iconoclasts are basically people who destroy images of gods, of saints, of uh, any uh, religious meaning. And it is something which is pretty much as old as humanity where different religions fight over supremacy, or where within one religion, uh, different ideas evolve, whether it is appropriate to have images, for example, of saints or not. You know, for example, if you think of all the uh, Catholic churches that were ransacked during the age of the Reformation in the 16th century in Europe, whereby iconoclast fellow Christians, but now of the Protestant kind, ransacked those churches and systematically destroyed all statues, all carvings, all santos that they could uh, get their hands on, all icons, because they believed that Protestantism, you know, the Protestant version of uh, Christianity, does not allow this kind of uh, statuary because it is idolatrous, that it is an insult to God. No, it's like worshiping an idol. And so if you think, uh, before I continue, uh, iconoclasm, the people who engage in this kind of activity, of course, are called iconoclasts, who challenge, cherish beliefs or venerated institutions on the grounds that they are erroneous or pernicious. Uh, in recent, well, in the past 10 years, we have come to uh, associate iconoclasm more with uh, the Islamic State and with uh, extremist uh, Islamist movements like the Taliban, like the ISIS in Iraq and Syria, uh, who we have seen here in Hatra destroying images, uh, which they consider uh, idolatrous. Uh, but like I said, it is something that is not 
confined to Islam, but can be found among all religions. The belief that the depiction of saints is against the will of God. Now, the most famous example of iconoclasm occurred in 2001, uh, when the Buddhas of Bamyan were dynamited by the then Taliban government. Here they are. There are actually two of them, the Western and the Eastern Buddha. Um, they were among the largest standing Buddha statues in the world. In fact, the Western one was the tallest standing Buddha anywhere on this earth. 55 meters high, the smaller one still 38 meters. Uh, the Western Buddha was built in 618 AD and the smaller one in 570 AD. Uh, after the destruction of the statues, the site became a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2003. Now, why was it blown up? Why was it destroyed? Well, because the Taliban government of Afghanistan at that time considered them as idols. Uh, we keep in mind, Islam does not allow the depiction of human beings, certainly not in a religious building or in a, uh, in a mosque. You will never find a statue or a painting of human beings in any uh, mosque or sacred Islamic building. And it is generally uh, discouraged, even outside the mosque. So here we have gigantic statues, images of human beings, moreover of the Buddhist faith, so the government saw this as against the Quran, against the will of God, and therefore decided to have them destroyed. Even though there are no Buddhists living in Afghanistan since hundreds or even a thousand years, ever since the place was conquered by uh, Islam in the, I think, 8th century AD. And so there were no Buddhists, but still they had to go. And they were blown up over several weeks and what is left today are those gigantic empty niches uh, left cast out of the rock. That is the most extreme case, but uh, iconoclasm doesn't necessarily involve uh, only Christians or Muslims uh, destroying religious buildings. An interesting case of iconoclasm is the demolition of the Babri Mosque in Ayodhya in India, that happened in 1992. Here we have an old picture of the mosque. It was built in uh, 1525 by the Mughal. And importantly, it was built on a site that is believed to have been a former Hindu temple. A temple that was probably, we do not know for sure, demolished in order to build the mosque. Maybe, maybe not. Um, the temple was possibly uh, dedicated to Rama, a very important Hindu god because Ayodhya is believed to be the birthplace of the god Rama, the Hindu god Rama. So the temple was built over with this mosque, which stood there. Uh, before I continue, we have to know that uh, actually the history of India is full of this conflict between Islam and Hinduism. No? Initially, uh, uh, all of India was Hindu, partially Buddhist, and then uh, when it was conquered by uh, the Muslims, much of the Hindu temples were systematically destroyed, uh, especially during the age of the Mughals, a lot of uh, Hindu temples in the 17th, 18th century were systematically destroyed by Mughal emperors, especially Aurangzeb, uh, in order to either replace them with mosques or to simply try to suppress the Hindu faith. And so you find a lot of uh, ruined Hindu structures all over India, mostly destroyed during the time of the Mughals. So the, Babri, the story of the Babri Mosque is part of that long history. The site has been in dispute between Muslims and uh, Hindus since the 19th century. And since the 1980s, there have been calls by the Hindu community to destroy the mosque and rebuild the temple that supposedly stood there before. And indeed, in 1992, during a rally, a mob of more than 100,000 people stormed the mosque, which at that time was uh, abandoned, and tore it down within three hours with their bare hands and leveled it. Nothing remains of it. The destruction of the Babri Mosque uh, spawned riots throughout India, also neighboring Pakistan, 
in Bangladesh, which left in the way 2,000 people dead. Just to give an idea of the immense symbolism that the destruction of built heritage can have. And it really costs real lives. So the mosque was leveled. And as you probably know, India is currently ruled by uh, what is normally termed a Hindu Nationalist Party, the BJP, by uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And uh, in line with the demands that were first made in the 19th century, uh, they laid a foundation in 2020 for now a uh, Hindu temple to be rebuilt on the site of the former Babri Mosque. So the Hindu Rama temple will be re-erected on the site of the mosque, asserting Hindu dominance over the site and over the city of Ayodhya. Uh, when we look a little bit closer to recent history, you probably heard about the systematic destruction of built heritage in Palmyra in Syria by uh, ISIS uh, in 2015. Here we have a picture. Uh, Palmyra is a, an oasis city in the center of uh, Syria, which had been engulfed in civil war, and it was conquered by ISIS in 2015. And uh, the city of Palmyra contains a lot of ancient temples, the largest of which was the Temple of Bel. And this was one of the most important pagan temples in the Middle East during the antiquity, dedicated to the Mesopotamian god Bel. And the architecture of the temple was particularly interesting. It was a combination of Western or Greco-Roman architecture with Eastern or Persian temple architecture. So very unique, very interesting. And it was among the best preserved temple ruins anywhere in the Middle East. So highly important, highly symbolic, and subsequently a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1980. Which, however, did nothing to uh, prevent ISIS from blowing it up in 2015. In fact, the importance of the temple may have even triggered the decision of ISIS to destroy it. Uh, the Bell Temple is not the only one that was destroyed. Another temple, the Baal Shemin Temple nearby, was also uh, dynamited in 2015, alongside a few other uh, sacred sites in Palmyra. Now you could think, okay, this has all to do with uh, the fact that these uh, holy sites, okay, nobody has been worshipped there. No pagan gods have been worshipped there since almost uh, 1,500 years. You know, the temple was closed down during antiquity already when Christianity took over. But you could say, well, okay, it's a pagan site, a pagan religious site, so maybe that's the reason why they blew it up. No, it's uh, in, it's in uh, reconceivable with uh, Islam, but no, there's more to it, because it was not only temples that were destroyed, but also non-religious buildings, like the famous Ark of Palmyra, which was dynamited by ISIS. Uh, other uh, sites, like the Roman amphitheater, was blown up. Many columns were destroyed. Uh, parts of the colonnades were uh, dynamited. These were non-religious structures. So why would ISIS destroy even non-religious buildings? Well, the reason is uh, it's more than just uh, idols. It's a systematic attempt to eradicate memory. Because we have to know that Palmyra was a meeting point of East and West, of North and South. It was a very cosmopolitan society during antiquity. It was very multi-ethnic. You had different tribes, different people coming from all corners of the Middle East mingling here. Most important, it was a very multi-religious site. There were many gods that were worshipped in the uh, city. You were free to worship whoever god you believed in. It was very tolerant in that regard. And last but not least, it was a society where women played a very important role. Most famous of all, Queen Zenobia who at some point in time was even challenging the Roman Empire and seriously uh, challenging its political power. Mm -hmm. Up to now, Queen Zenobia is something like a national hero in Syria. And all of this, mm -hmm. cosmopolitanism, religious tolerance, uh, society where women played an important role, runs counter to the extremist Islamic interpretation of ISIS. And therefore, this kind of memory had to be eradicated. Because 
if you control the past, you control the present. We learned this very well in the novel by George Orwell, 1984. Those of you who have read it will know what I mean, whereby history is controlled by the party. History is systematically censored, changed, eradicated in order to fit the narrative of the ruling party. And we can see the same thing playing out here in Palmyra. You eradicate the memory of the past so that the only thing that the people of today do remember is ISIS, is Islam, is the extremist interpretation of Islam by ISIS. Wipe out the past to control the present. If you don't know the past, you will not call for change because you don't know any better. Again, I asked my question, can you think of similar examples in Asia or in the Philippines? We come to our third factor, threatening built heritage, which is class conflict. Uh, this is primarily in connection with socialist and communist beliefs of how society operates or should operate. Now here we have a depiction how the capitalist system supposedly works, where you have the monarchy supported by the clergy and the aristocracy, building their power on the military, who are funded by the bourgeoisie, but all of this is carried by the ordinary laborers, by the ordinary people. The capitalist system through communist perspective. And all of this was uh, to be challenged during the Cultural Revolution in China from 1966 to 1976. Um, China had become communist in uh, 1949 and Mao Zedong uh, launched the Cultural Revolution as an attempt to retain power. No? Before then there had been a disastrous um, famine caused by the Great Leap Forward which was triggered by Mao, so he was uh, in danger of losing power. And therefore, in order to regain the power he lost, he uh, launched the Cultural Revolution. And the, the motto or the prime target of the Cultural Revolution was to eradicate what he called the old ways of thinking. And with it, to eradicate and destroy all historic artifacts which represent these old ways of thinking, those feudal ways, those religious ways, those uh, bourgeois ways of thinking, which are reflected in art, in historic buildings, especially temples, yeah, or in archives. Countless archives, libraries were destroyed, old books were burned, paintings were destroyed, artworks were smashed, antiques were burned or sold abroad, and uh, innumerable historic buildings were destroyed all over China. Now, it was a disastrous loss. China probably lost 30 to 50 percent of all of its cultural heritage in those 10 years. To give some figures of uh, 80 cultural heritage sites that existed in Beijing and were under municipal protection at that time, 30 were destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. And of uh, 6,843 cultural sites under protection by the Beijing government in 1958, almost 5,000 were severely damaged or destroyed. In fact, uh, uh, it went so far that uh, uh, the, um, the Red Guards, who were primarily responsible for all these atrocities, went to the Ming tombs near Beijing and uh, broke into one of the uh, mausoleums of the emperors and burned the skeleton of the emperor Wan Li of the Ming dynasty. Yeah. Burned the bones in front of his mausoleum because he was considered to be representing the land owning class, even though he had been dead 300 years already. So it was quite extreme. It was not only China where the Cultural Revolution played out. The same thing happened in uh, Russia, especially in the early phases of the uh, communist takeover in the 1920s. 
Uh, a famous example of that is the Cathedral of Christ, of the Savior in Moscow, in uh, what was then Russia and later became the Soviet Union. This one is a huge church, the third largest uh, Orthodox church ever built, uh, built 1839 to 1883, uh, in memory of the Russian victory over the invading forces of Napoleon in 1812. So a huge building, very significant, a golden dome, marble all over, very significant. But then in 1917, we see the takeover of the communists, October Revolution, the communists take power, and the communists come in with a fiercely anti-religious and anti-clerical ideology, uh, which became particularly uh, brutal when uh, Stalin took over from Lenin. And in the 1930s, uh, Stalin made plans to demolish the church, which presented religion and uh, the clergy and to replace it with a 500 meter tall palace of the Soviets. You can see it here on the left side, a 500 meter tall skyscraper. On top of it would be a statue of Lenin, another 100 meters tall with outstretched arms, symbolizing the triumph of communism over religion. That was the plan. It never materialized because there were lack of funds. There were problems with flooding because the site is close to the Neva River. And finally, when World War II broke out, the plans were buried with finality. So this actually became uh, an empty plot because the cathedral was still demolished in 1931 on the orders of Stalin to make place for the palace of the Soviets. The demolished site was an empty pool, in fact, a public swimming pool for a long time. And then in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed the communist regime came to an end. And at that time, we see a re-emergence of uh, Orthodox Christianity in Russia. And with this came a uh, desire by Orthodox Christians to rebuild the cathedral that had been destroyed by Stalin 60 years earlier. And so it happened. The cathedral was rebuilt pretty close to the original from 1994 to 2000 on the same site and now basically stands as a triumph of religion over communism. Like the famous saying goes, Stalin says, God is dead, and God replies, Stalin is dead. Triumph of religion over communism. Here again, can you think of similar examples in Asia or the Philippines? Glorification of dictatorship. Um, it is a common pastime of dictators to appropriate the past in order to justify their own dictatorial regime. We all know it here from the Philippines, but perhaps the most interesting example involving built heritage comes actually from Iraq. Iraq, um, more precisely from the site of Babylon, mentioned in the Bible, Babylon, uh, one of the largest uh, archaeological sites in the Middle East today, was the metropolis, the undisputed dis metropolis of the Middle East during antiquity, especially during the reign of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar II, who reigned from 640 to 562 before Christ. King of the Babylonian Empire, who is responsible for the completion of the Tower of Babel, mentioned in the Bible, for the hanging garden, as well as the famous Ishtar gate. But more importantly, at least to the one who followed in his footsteps, was that he conquered Israel and Jerusalem in 587 and 597 BC, which, is the, which marks the beginning of the Babylonian exile of the Jews. And who saw himself as a successor of this uh, fabulous Nebuchadnezzar II? Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein tried to link himself and to depict himself as a worthy successor of Nebuchadnezzar because he was also fiercely anti-Israel, anti-Jewish. And he threatened warfare during uh, Israel during the First Gulf War. So he tried to depict himself as a successor of Nebuchadnezzar II. And he did that by launching the so-called archaeological restoration of Babylon project in 1978 
whereby much of the historic city of Babylon, which by that time was largely destroyed, very little remained, by rebuilding on the historic ruins, like we see here on the right side. So he reconstructed, much based on speculation, the palace of Nebuchadnezzar. He reconstructed the processional way, the Lion of Babylon and the amphitheater. And he even proposed to reconstruct the hanging gardens and the ziggurat, also known as the Tower of Babel, which was a temple. But this was not implemented because the Iran-Iraq war broke out before that could be done. And so he really put himself in the shoes of Nebuchadnezzar, the one who defeated the Jews. And for everybody to get the message, there was a huge portrait of Saddam Hussein and of Nebuchadnezzar II at the main entrance to Babylon to really get the message across. No? He is the successor of Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, he even had his name inscribed on the bricks that were used for the reconstruction, very much like King Nebuchadnezzar did uh, when uh, Babylon was built in antiquity. And the bricks read, this was built by Saddam Hussein, son of Nebuchadnezzar, to glorify Iraq. So really the appropriation of heritage in a very unscientific way in order to glorify the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein. Similar projects were undertaken in Nineveh, in Nimrud, in Assur, in Hatra, all over Iraq with the same purpose, glory to the dictator. In fact, he even had a palace built for himself in 1991, the so-called Saddam Hill Palace overlooking the ruins of Babylon and very much shaped like an antique uh, temple or ziggurat. Again, can you think of similar examples in Asia and the Philippines? I'm sure you can. We'll leave that for the later discussion. Uh, let's come to the use of heritage or the reconstruction of heritage in order to reassert national identity, which is a particularly interesting chapter when states try to reassert themselves. Here we have the Japanese government building in Seoul in Korea. This was the government building. It was the seat of the governor general during the Japanese occupation of uh, Korea, which lasted from 1905 to 1945. And importantly, this government building was built not just somewhere, but it was built right smash at the site of a former royal palace gate. That palace gate, which gave access to the royal palace behind it, was demolished, and the government building was built there in 1926. Why? Because by building the government building, the separation, the, the link between the Korean people and the monarchy, Korea was a monarchy at that time, was symbolically separated. And now the colonial government takes symbolically the place of the Korean monarchy, which was abolished. Yeah. So it is really a, a piece of power architecture, showing everybody who is now in charge. So the Japanese colonial administration takes the place of the Korean monarchy. Now the thing is that uh, this building was actually used also by independent Korea as uh, the seat of government and later as the National Museum. But there have always been calls to reconstruct the palace gate that had been demolished in 1926, the so-called uh, gate to the Jeongbokgung Palace. I'm sure I pronounced it wrongly, but uh, forgive me for that. The calls finally were heeded and Korea decided to demolish the government building in 1990, even though it was an acknowledged heritage structure of immense historical value. Like I said, it was uh, the seat of the Japanese colonial administration. It was part of the Korean government. It was the National Museum. But it was deemed more important for national pride, for national Korean identity, to reconstruct the palace gate, to reestablish the link of the Korean people with their historic past with the monarchy, with the pre-Japanese uh, Korean kingdom. Now, re establish the link between palace and city, between palace and the people. Uh, mind you, this only happened to this particular building. Other colonial buildings 
like uh, the railway station, the city hall were preserved, are still preserved today. But this one had to go in order to reassert national identity and national pride. A similar thing played out in Malaysia. Here we see the Royal Sultan's Palace in Malacca in Malaysia. This is a reconstruction, it's not the original. In fact, the original was destroyed already in 1511, 500 years ago by the Portuguese when they conquered Malacca from the Malay. Malay uh, Malacca was an important Malay kingdom. In fact, the modern state of Malaysia sees itself as a successor to the Sultanate of Malacca. The problem is after the city was conquered by the Portuguese, uh, all traces of the Malay past of Malacca were destroyed or were lost. And today Malacca consists of colonial architecture from the Portuguese, from the Dutch, even from the British, as well as uh, hundreds of Chinese shop houses. But there's nothing Malay in Malacca. So the government of Malaysia decided to reconstruct the royal palace that was built, uh, destroyed 500 years ago. Erica, are you still there? Oh. Yeah. Okay, we are experiencing some technical difficulties right now. We will just uh, contact the speaker. We're going to wait for him to reconnect. Yes. Yes, Nagkampusha. We are going to reconnect with Eric in a few moments. Yeah, uh, while we are waiting for Eric, uh, for now I can read some of the comments. So thank you everyone for coming today. So we have an interesting comment from Bibi Monkey. So he's, uh, they said that through the emergence of Christian, uh, this is in response to uh, a comment by Abigail. Uh, Uh, no, from Ardit. So Ardit said the emergence of Christianity took away the original religious practices and beliefs of the people of the Philippines. Yeah, maybe this is true because uh, uh, iconoclasm took a more intangible form, it can be said, in the Philippines. And uh, Bibi Monkey in response said that the emergence of Christianity even demonized colonial beliefs. So there's this uh, displacement of uh, old beliefs in favor of more uh, of the Christian belief. Right. Ray Carlo has an example for the glorification of dictatorship. His example is uh, Socarno and Marcos in the 1970s, mobilizing history for reformulating national identity to shed of colonial history. Thank you for that.
we have a point of reflection here from Edgar. He said that uh, most of the ethnic cleansing are triggered because of religion. Can we say that religion is the source of humanity's never learning history? So that's a point uh, where uh, there's a point for discussion where we can all reflect on the role of religion in the destruction or in the creation of our national monuments. Thank you, Nina. So Nina said that one of the pre-colonial documents that was able to survive was the Laguna Copper Plate inscription. And Manila, on the other hand, was destroyed heavily by the, during the Second World War. And all buildings, as well as the tramway, were affected. Okay, I'm back. Sean, what happened? Yeah, you were gone for a few minutes, but it's okay. Sorry I'm about really that. that. You got reconnected. It looked like we lost internet connection. Uh, where was I when I when I stopped? Uh, I think. Uh, yeah, that one. That one here, here at the Sultan's Palace. Ah, okay. Okay, yeah, I do not know. Yes, in order to reassert uh, the Malay yeah. identity of Malacca. No? Now you okay. have to see that in connection with the Bumiputra policy, where preference is given over Malay uh, Muslims over Chinese and uh, Indians. So it pretty much goes in line. Okay, sorry, it looks like we lost a little bit of time. I'll try to catch up with it later. Uh, another interesting object of observation is Shanghai, no? the showcase of modern China. But uh, the relationship with the, of the Chinese with Shanghai is a little bit uneven because uh, on the one hand, it's a showcase of uh, progress, but at the same time, it's also a symbol of the Western domination of China. No? Just think of the unequal treaties in the 19th century. So it's a love-hate relationship. In any way, in order to reassert more of the Chinese roots of the city, the Chinese uh, have started to actually reconstruct part of the medieval Ming city. It actually dates back to the Ming period. But uh, not in any scientific or historically accurate way, but rather as a commercial tourist complex, like the one you see here, made of steel, glass, concrete, 
but uh, vaguely resembling what uh, the Chinese consider to be a uh, Ming city. Here we have an interior uh, photo of the courtyard. Now, all these are modern buildings made to look like uh, they imagined uh, the medieval Shanghai to look like. Now, what is interesting about this one is that in order to build, oh, by the way, here we have an overview. No? This is the whole complex, how it will look like in the future. We find that in the Shanghai City Museum. Now, the interesting thing is in order to build this gigantic reconstructed, pseudo reconstructed Ming city, uh, Shanghai is actually demolishing genuine heritage architecture, like those uh, workers districts from the 1920s and 1930s, which however hark back to the colonial era you know, when Shanghai was under Western dominance. So they had to make way in order to rebuild this uh, recreated Ming city. Here we have some other pictures. This is what will be gone in a few years time in order to have this, uh, let me say, somewhat Disney-esque replica of medieval Shanghai. So original substance has to go, original heritage has to go in order to reassert the Chinese-ness of Shanghai as a commercial tourist complex. So we asked the question, is it appropriate to demolish old historic structures in order to reconstruct even older historic ones? Now, regardless of whether they are accurate or fake. Maybe we can also discuss that in the discussion later. Finally, we come to post-war reconstruction. Post-war reconstruction after World War II, which took place and devastated much of Europe, but also Asia and how it played out with regards to nationalism, with regards to identity. Here we have Warsaw, 1945, the Polish capital, totally destroyed. And this is how the old city looks like today. Now, you wouldn't believe that a World War II has taken place, that all of this had been raised to the ground. It looks perfect. This is actually the newest old city in Europe. Uh, Flashback in history, in 1944, Nazi Germany tried to systematically destroy Warsaw, leave no stone on top of the other. The aim was to systematically and deliberately destroy Polish culture and to wipe out Polish history and identity. It was really deliberate. It was not due to the war. It was really a deliberate attempt to destroy Polish identity. Because Poland was to be turned into a German colony and the Polish people were to be enslaved, killed or deported. That was really the plan. And because of this systematic attempt to destroy Polish identity, the Polish made the same concerted and systematic effort to reconstruct their destroyed heritage in order to reassert their national history and identity. And reconstructed everything, the royal palace, the churches, even though at that time, Poland was actually under a communist regime. And you can imagine communists are not very fond of royal palaces and churches. But it didn't matter because the notion of Polish identity was more important than political ideology at this point in time. And today you have Warsaw. Uh, something similar played out in the city of Dansk, which today also belongs to Poland. This one uh, is a case that has always been in dispute between Germans and Polish. Uh, from 1224 to 1793, for 550 years, the city was primarily occupied by Germans, but they were living under the rule of the Polish crown, under the sovereignty of the Polish king. In 1793, the city became German, Prussian, and remained so until 1945. In 1945, the city was largely destroyed, especially the old town. And after the war, it became part of Poland for good. Now, when the Polish decided to reconstruct the old city, the old heritage, they deliberately reconstructed only those buildings that were built when the city was under Polish rule. In, every, in other words, everything before 1793. Heritage structures that were built during German rule after 1793 were not reconstructed in order to reassert the Polishness of Danzig once and for all. An even more extreme case of how uh, identity played out with regards to heritage is the city of Königsberg in Germany, 
which uh, used to be under German rule until 1945. In fact, it was the old capital of Prussia, which later it evolved into the modern Germany. And the city was likewise destroyed in the closing years of World War II in 1945. And after 1945, that part became Russian. It was, became part of the Russian uh, Federation and of the Soviet Union. And the Russians decided to wipe out German identity even more systematically than the Polish by destroying all and all war ruins, except for one lone building, which is the cathedral. Otherwise, all the built evidence of 700 years of German history were systematically blown up, demolished, eradicated. And the entire German population was deported to the West. And the city was also renamed. Königsberg became Kaliningrad, named after a communist leader. And the entire city center, which had been cleared of all historic buildings, was to be rebuilt as the communist model city that we see here. White avenues, uniform high-rise apartment buildings, white uh, avenues, green spaces, no, a typical Soviet or Stalin era uh, communist model city. When we talk about reconstruction, I would like to illustrate one particular example, particularly interesting example from Germany, how interpretation is shifting over time. While what we consider in one way in the past may be considering totally different a few decades later. Here we have the Berlin city palace. This one was built in uh, the 15th century. Actually, it was started in the 15th century and continued to be expanded and elaborated until 1583. And it was the seat of the kings of Prussia and later of the German emperors until they were thrown out in World War I. Now, the palace became a museum and in 1945 was totally destroyed by air attack. So, before 1945, the palace was a symbol of the Prussian monarchy, the kings of Prussia and later the German emperors. So a symbol of the monarchy and of the German empire. Now, after the war, this part of Berlin, East Berlin, became communist and became the capital of East Germany. And now the communists didn't really have much of a liking for feudalism, monarchy. And therefore, after 1945, the palace was seen as a symbol of a dark and deplorable era, a symbol of feudalism, of imperialism, of colonialism. Germany had colonies during the empire. And a symbol of the, pro of the suppression of the proletariat. And therefore, the palace, even though it could have been restored, it was only slightly damaged, it was burned out, but it was structurally sound. It could have been reconstructed, it could have been refurbished, no problem. But because of its ideological ballast, the communist regime of East Germany decided nothing shall remind us about our infamous past. And with that in mind, the government, the communist government of East Germany decided to demolish the ruins and let them disappear once and for all. And in its place, oh, before I continue, not the entire palace was destroyed. One small piece was actually saved, namely this portal or rizalit. Why? Because on this portal was declared in 1918 the first free socialist republic in Germany by Karl Liebknecht. Karl Liebknecht is the ideological father of the East German communists. So they see him as an ideological founding father. And therefore, this is the only piece of the palace that was actually dismantled, taken away, and reintegrated into a modern building, namely the State Council building of East Germany, for that only very reason. Now, because this portal is a symbol for the attainment of the goals of Karl Liebknecht, the communist leader during the Weimar Republic, and of the November Revolution, which is at the heart of the German Democratic Republic and its history. So the rest of the palace was destroyed, demolished, 
and replaced in the 1970s with the so-called Palace of the Republic, which was a multi-purpose building and the seat of the Volkskammer or the Parliament of East Germany. And here we have it. Very popular building. This was sort of the most important state architecture of East communist East Germany. This is where you had uh, festivities, where you had events, where you had uh, restaurants, bowling alleys. This is where TV shows were broadcast. This was really a house for the people. Very modern, very popular with East Germans. Palace of the Republic, very open. You can just walk in like that. No, there's no security. Anybody's free to enter, enjoy the restaurants, enjoy the amenities. But it's also a political building because it is the seat of the East German parliament, which of course doesn't have real power, but only symbolic power. But in 1989, communism collapsed in East Germany and uh, the communists lost power. And now the Palace of the Republic was reconsidered and now seen as a symbol of an oppressive and totalitarian communist regime. Very bad. And it so happened at that time, it was discovered that the palace was actually contaminated with asbestos. And therefore, the decision was made to demolish it. Even though it could have been decontaminated. In fact, other buildings in Berlin, like the International Congress Center in West Berlin, which also had asbestos, were actually uh, decontaminated and renovated. But this thing had to go because it had this ideological ballast. It was a reminder of communism. And therefore, it had to be demolished. And so it was done. Over a course of 10 years, the place was gradually taken apart. Here we see uh, in the middle of the demolition process, in fact, this is interesting. Somebody wrote on the foundations of the demolished palace of the Republic, the DDR had es nie gegeben, which basically translates into the GDR, East Germany, never existed. Yeah. Accusing those who demolished the palace of trying to wipe out East German communist history. And why was the palace of the Republic destroyed? Well, in order to reconstruct the Berlin city palace of the German kings and emperors. Because the vanished building was now reinterpreted as an indispensable ingredient of the urban fabric of Berlin and as its logical center, which is true in a way, because Berlin grew around the royal palace. And it was considered an important part of German history, which it certainly was. No? the residence of the Prussians and the emperors. It was also claimed that it, was, it had very high artistic value with all its artwork and sculpture and had very high aesthetic appeal. And therefore, even though the move was extremely controversial, now the old royal palace was reconstructed from 2013 until 2021. It will probably be finished next year. So another way of dealing with history with dynamite and bulldozers. A similar case played out with the garrison church in Potsdam. Potsdam is something like the Versailles of Berlin, some uh, 30 kilometers out of the city center. This is the garrison church, which was built in 1735. Uh, we have to know Prussia was a very militaristic uh, country. The military played key role. And this church was not only the garrison church, but it was also the tomb of uh, King Frederick the Great one of the greatest German monarchs, but who was also extremely aggressive in his foreign policy, waging wars left and right. So he's buried there. What makes it worse? In 1933, there was the so-called Day of Potsdam when Adolf Hitler met the then uh, president of Germany, Hindenburg, to shake hands, which basically paved the way for Hitler to assume complete political power in Germany at that time. And this took place in Potsdam in front of the garrison church. So now you have a building that is associated not only with militarism, with uh, aggression, but also with Nazism, with fascism, as uh, portrayed in this postcard here that was uh, published to celebrate the event, the day of Potsdam. So not surprisingly, in 1945, the church was damaged by Allied war bombing. And because of all its ideological past, 
the then communist regime of East Germany, again decided, although the church could have been restored, decided to demolish it because it was a symbol of militarism, reactionism, monarchism, imperialism, fascism, you put it all, it had to go. And therefore it was demolished in 1968 and for no other reason. Last but not least, how does Germany deal with the relics of its Nazi past? Uh, the fascist era was one of the darkest in German history. It left uh, behind some monumental architecture, especially in Nuremberg, the so-called Nazi party rally grounds. You can see here. And they're still here today. They were not demolished after the war. They still exist. You can visit them. And how do you deal with this kind of uh, architecture that is celebrating a totalitarian, monstrous regime yeah. that triggered World War II, that killed six million Jews? How do you deal with such kind of heritage? The largest of the remaining Nazi structures in Nuremberg is the so-called Congress Hall. Here we see it. It was never uh, finished. Only the exterior is complete. The inside was never completed. And uh, the Germans decided, well, OK, there were several proposals. Let's make it into a shopping mall. Let's make it into uh, a Congress center. Let's make it into, I don't know, a Home Depot. All of this was dismissed as seemingly not appropriate to the significance of the site, the largest remaining Nazi structure anywhere in Europe. And therefore it was decided to preserve it as a historical ruin, but also to reinterpret it. In other words, uh, we will use it as a museum and we will have an exhibit there which will critically discuss the Nazi era and why it was so fatally attractive to millions of Germans who so much uh, supported Hitler. So it became the site of the so-called exhibit Fascination and Terror, which seeks to explore the attraction that fascism had for Germans in the 1930s. To do so, uh, the building was uh, appropriated. They didn't use the original main entrance because it would have seen as sort of endorsing fascist architecture. Rather, they cut a 10 meter long gap into a side wall that you see here. And that becomes the main entrance to the modern museum that is built on top of the structure, the so-called interpretation center. So you use the structure, but you do not use the iconography that was intended by the Nazis. You do not use the symbolism that was intended by the fascists, but rather you create your own entrance in order to come up with your very own interpretation of this symbol of fascism and totalitarianism. And then you have the exhibit inside, which shows the... Uh, the rallies that took place during that time and yeah, why there was so much fascination about the regime. A very critical, very interesting exhibit. Again, can you think of similar examples? Is it appropriate way to deal with ideologically charged buildings? We can discuss that later. We now bring the link to Intramuros. This is how Intramuros looked like in 1945. We all know the story, totally destroyed during the liberation. And uh, one strange thing about Intramuros is that it remained in ruins for 30, 40 years after the end of the war. The rest of Manila was rebuilt very quickly, but Intramuros was not. And it begs the question why. It also begs the question why a lot of the surviving heritage structures were demolished, even though they could have been restored. Churches like San Augustine de Tolentino, uh, sorry, San Nicolas de Tolentino, the Dominican church, the Augustinian churches, those were all very solid structures and the ruins most likely could have been restored. Some were not that much damaged, but it wasn't done and they were demolished and bulldozed. And this has to do not only, but importantly, with the demonization of the Spanish era. And this demonization actually started with the uh, Americans taking over from the Spanish in 1898. Um, now, when a new colonizer takes over a previously colonized people, it is in his interest to make the previous colonizers look as bad as possible, so that in comparison, the new colonizers look as good as possible. And this has worked miraculously well in the Philippines. We still, many of us still have this notion of condemning the Spanish era, but uh, many of us are very uncritical 
about the American colonial period. In fact, this uh, black legend is not an invention of the 19th century. It actually goes back all the way to the 16th century. The so-called black legend, the condemning of Spanish rule as uh, um, unsophisticated, as uneducated, as oppressive, um, unenlightened, goes back to the 16th century when the uh, Netherlands started their war of independence from Spain. And they uh, systematically perpetrated uh, Spanish cruelties and abuses in order to justify uh, their war of independence, of liberation, and to seek international support. And, and when the Americans came in, they basically uh, used that legend and used it in order to glorify their own colonial rule. In fact, in 1901, there were even proposals to demolish the walls of Intramuros altogether because they were seen as an obstacle to development. Luckily, thanks to Daniel Burnham, who was called in as a city planner in 1905, he decided that the wall should be preserved as a historical monument, and therefore they are still with us. Otherwise, we would have lost them 100 years ago already. 1945, near total destruction of Intramuros, and then Intramuros became pretty much a vast no-go area, a squatter, a giant squatter colony, very dangerous to go in. And a year later, the Philippines became independent. And with independence comes a critical re-evaluation of the colonial past. And that has implications for Intramuros. For example, in the 1960s, Intramuros was still in ruins then, a prominent Filipino historian wrote, the history of Intramuros in the century is, sorry, that's a spelling error. The history of Intramuros is, okay, once again, the history of Intramuros in the centuries of Spanish rule is part of the history of Spain in her overseas colonial possessions and not of the Filipinos in their own country. This is debatable, but it shows the national sentiment in the 1960s when there was an attempt to rid the country of its colonial heritage in order to start on a clean new slate. In fact, in 1964, when the then mayor of Manila suggested to restore the walls, this was objected by the Philippine Historical Committee, which objected to the restoration on the grounds that the walls of Impramuros were a hated symbol, which must have been a source of humiliation and despair for our forebears. Now, indeed, it really took until the arrival of the Marcoses to change this mindset. Some historians at that point, again, proposed to demolish the walls of Intramuros altogether, not to restore them, in order to get rid of this heritage of colonialism. And it was really only in 1979, with the onset of the Marcos regime, like it or not, that we have a re-evaluation of the colonial past, we had the interest, of course, the personal interest of Imelda Marcos in art, her desire for some kind of cultural pedigree, which also includes the colonial, and also the desire to make Intramuros a tourist attraction in order to attract international tourists to Manila, played an important role. And all those changes finally enabled the systematic rebuilding of Intramuros, which up to date is still ongoing, thanks to the Intramuros administration. So you see, politics, plays a huge role in the evaluation and assessment of heritage. And it can either promote it or it can destroy it. But heritage has a very strong ideological component, which must never be dismissed and respected. With that, I say thank you, Madam Ming Salamatpo. Sorry for the interruption. I hope we will have none during the now following discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Akpidono. Uh, for that very enlightening presentation. Now we are going to open our open forum. So for those who are interested to raise their questions, you are encouraged to do so. For those who are viewing via Zoom, there is a Q&A button below your screen. So feel free to raise your questions with the Q&A button. And for our viewers in Facebook, feel free to key in your questions in the comment section and then I will read them out loud on air for you. Right. So we have several questions already, both in the chat box and in the Q&A. Now, uh, uh, before that, uh, if I may ask, 
in the six categories which you have presented, namely ethnic cleansing, iconoclasm, class struggle, glorification, dictatorship, etc. Uh, in the six, how would you categorize the destruction of monuments inspired by the Black Lives Matter mo uh, movement? Is it should we classify it under class struggle? No, because class struggle is uh, clearly defined as class. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is really based on ethnicity, on race. Uh, so the term class struggle wouldn't fit here. No? Um, the Black Lives Matter movement is, yeah, it's a very controversial question. Are they trying to rewrite history or are they trying to... Um, to eradicate structures which are seen as insulting. Uh, it's a very controversial question because uh, both applies. Mm -hmm. By taking down a monument, you change the history. Um, at the same time, by leaving it there, you promote a certain way of telling history. Yes. Um, obviously, the way uh, white right-wing southerners see, for example, the Civil War, very much differs from the way uh, your average Afro-American would see it. Um, it's an interesting question. In fact, I use it in my class uh, as an illustrative point and ask them to find an appropriate solution for monuments like that, that do not try to eradicate history, but rather to reinterpret it. Uh, so should there be seven categories then, with the seventh uh, racial struggle? Well, I would put that under ethnic. Ethnic cleansing? In a way, yes, you could say that. But uh, um, <laughs> it, 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 it is, of course, a little bit far-fetched. No? Yeah. Uh, there are many ways how, to, how uh, the rewriting of history takes place. Ethnic cleansing normally, uh, sorry, what we discussed earlier in the presentation is usually ethnic cleansing that is accompanied by the destruction of uh, cultural icons or vice versa, their destruction is accompanied by the deportation of the indigenous population. That, of course, is not the case in the Black Lives Matter movement. So maybe it's a category in its own right. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a question from BB Monkey. So they said, how do the Balkan states manage the historical denialism and revisionism in their own countries? How did they rectify the errors in historiography, considering that Yugoslavia breakup just happened 20 years ago? So, uh, and also, how is the neo-colonial and nationalist discourse in South Asia, uh, especially among the youth? I ask this because I can see many videos of Pakistani youth ardently shouting, Pakistan, Zindabad recently. Okay, I'm not quite sure whether I got the question right. Um, how is the nationalist uh, um, narrative playing out in Southeast Asia or South Asia? Sorry, was it South Asia or Southeast Asia? Uh, no, uh, so I'm going to repeat the question. So how do the Balkan states, so the, uh, Bibi has two questions. The first one is, how do the Balkan states manage the historical denialism and revisionism in their own countries? How did they rectify the errors in historiography, considering that the breakup of Yugoslavia happened just 20 years ago? Okay, let's and leave it. Question. Let, let, let's uh, answer the first question first. Okay. Uh, Yugoslavia has been under immense pressure, or I should rather say the follow up states of Yugoslavia, like Serbia, uh, Croatia, Bosnia, have been under immense pressure from the international community to reconcile. The truth is that uh, most of the local inhabitants are, let me say, still scarred by the wounds of war. Many of them have lost uh, loved ones and relatives in the wars. But it is the international community which is forcing upon the successor state of Yugoslavia to reconcile, sometimes against their will, but nonetheless quite successful. And that is the reason why you see all those uh, destroyed heritage sites being reconstructed. No, it's not that the people of Yugoslavia suddenly discovered that, oh, we were actually brothers before we became enemies. This happens under international pressure, but also massively funded by uh, international uh, donors. 
primarily by uh, the European Union in the wake of uh, reconciliation, and secondly by the Republic of Turkey in an attempt to re-establish the Turkish heritage of Yugoslavia. I'm not sure whether that answers the question. What's the second one? Uh, the second one is, uh, how is the neo-colonial and nationalist discourse in South Asia, uh, how would you describe it, especially among the youth? I ask this because I can see many videos of Pakistani youth ardently shouting Pakistan Sindabad recently. <laughs> well, I do not know. Um, that would be a sociological question. I'm not very familiar with the current narrative in South Asia. What I do know is the very different ways of interpretation of heritage and of history. Take, for example, the, the mosque. Or let, let's first of all go into the history of India. Um, in the West, there is the Mughal Emperor Akbar I, who in pretty much all our textbooks is highly revered for being uh, a great leader of India, somebody who was very tolerant, who did not suppress Hindus, who in fact uh, engaged with them in spiritual dialogue. In fact, he engaged with Christians, with Muslims, and with Hindus, and with Buddhists in his capital, Agra. So he was very tolerant. And in India, he's seen as a great Mughal emperor and pretty much in the West also. But interestingly, in Pakistan, he's seen as a very bad emperor, exactly because he's so tolerant. On the other hand, the emperor Aurangzeb, whom I mentioned in my talk earlier, who is known for being extremely pious, for being a devout Muslim who destroyed many Hindu temples and heavily taxed the Hindus, is considered a very bad ruler in India, but a great ruler in Pakistan. So you can see this uh, nationalist uh, interpretation of history that uh, dates back 300 years still plays out today. And if you go on the website or into the internet, you will see several um, pictures of mosque, sorry, of Hindu temples that have been converted into mosque. And I've seen quite a number of websites. And all those pictures show, for example, you could see the front wall is uh, Hindu, but the back of the building is uh, Islamic because it's a mosque, it has been converted. And this would be decried as uh, examples of the terrorism of Islam on Hindu sites in India. So the conflicts that happened 300 years ago still very much are alive in the politics of India and Pakistan today. I'm not sure whether that answers the question. For more, I would have to do a, a sociological survey in India, but uh, I hope this throws some light on how the past still very much shapes our present. And if you've ever wondered why uh, there is so much hatred between India and Pakistan, it goes back centuries. And it hasn't been forgotten today. Uh, thank you so much for that. And thank you, Bibi, for that question. Now, in the, uh, just a question, in the destruction, in the demolition of uh, various heritage uh, buildings in Manila, would you say that there's any ideological justification for such, or is it just merely driven by profit? Well, as far as Intramuros is concerned, there were several factors at work. First of all, the ones who would bulldoze most of the surviving ruins, even though they could have been saved, were the U.S. military. And the military, not only the U.S. military, but any military, is not particularly, let me say, well-trained in the importance of built heritage or history or culture. They are military men, they have their objectives, and they normally pursue them often at the expense of uh, heritage and preservation. That's the first thing. In fact, the Manila Cathedral would have been bulldozed as well if it hadn't been for some engaged uh, Manila citizens who intervened, sort of threw themselves in front of the bulldozers who were about to demolish the ruins of the cathedral as well. Luckily, uh, they succeeded, so the cathedral is still with us today, but all the other churches were demolished. So the military, which is not particularly interested in uh, history. Secondly, uh, the orders which left Manila, the churches were not demolished because they were Spanish. They were demolished for practical purposes and because there was no interest. 
No? This was not seen as something important to the Filipino nation. No? So demolition is the result not of aggression, but rather of negligence. We didn't consider it part of our heritage, of our history, and therefore we didn't take care of it. And we allowed it to be demolished in the wake of well, converting Intramuros basically into a giant warehouse for trucks, for delivery, for squatters. Now, this is how the San Ignacio church survived, because it was converted into a warehouse. Other ruins like the San Tolentino or the Augustinian churches were not, uh, not Augustinian, Dominican churches were not so lucky. How about the demolitions that are currently happening in the present, so for example, the Sunico foundry, uh, among others? Is it merely driven by, only by profit, or is there any ideological justification for I think, such okay. destruction? I think we are past the 1960s when uh, even Filipino historians advocated the demolition of historic structures as symbols of oppression. We are beyond that, thank God. But there's still a widespread lack of appreciation that uh, hasn't really changed that much. Uh, the Sunico foundry is a somewhat special case. Um, I'm sure if it had been located in a different um, location, it probably would have been saved. Because when you deal with heritage, you always have to balance commercial interests vis-a-vis heritage and preservation interests. And in an environment like Binondo or San Nicolas, where ground prices are extraordinarily high, it is very difficult to justify preservation. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that it is okay to demolish it, but uh, you always have to balance those two. If it had been located in some provincial town, I'm quite sure the result would have been different. Uh, we have a question from Zoom. Uh, this is a question inspired by the Berlin City Palace. Who gives a say on a certain heritage structure symbolism? Surely not everybody has the same point of view, and this could be another controversial source of conflict by those involved in the stakeholders. So who determines the value? The value is determined by public debate, basically carried out by uh, the media, print media, uh, TV, radio, books, publications, papers, conferences. It's a discourse. Now, there's no one person who declares this is heritage or this is not. Um, it's a matter of debate. And in the course of that debate, which can drag on for years or even decades, uh, certain points uh, crystallize over time and they become, let me say, uh, commonly accepted or commonly disputed uh, standpoints. It's a matter of public debate. And in that final debate, the judge is the, the government? In the final, well, it is again uh, several factors coming together. No? It can be the cultural institution, um, you will be driven by law to some extent. Uh, it's not a single person. Again, it's uh, trying to reach some kind of consensus. Um, depending on how strong your heritage preservation laws are, um, the decision may be primarily guided by those laws or in the place where the laws are weak, like in the Philippines, the decision may primarily be guided by practical considerations. Thank you for that. Uh, in the reconstruction of Intramuros, especially in the, in the 70s and in the creation of the Intramuros administration in 1979 and in the uh, reconstruction of the walls of Intramuros, can we say that it is a form of glorification of dictatorship aside from the assertion of national identity because it is a project of the president at the time? I think that would be a little bit far-fetched. I mean, some projects are clearly identified with the Marcoses, like the CCP. Uh, in the case of the walls, uh, yes, we do know that this was uh, initiated by the Marcoses, but it's not really their showcase object. I mean, you wouldn't see a portrait uh, of uh, Imelda or her name uh, sizzled into the walls. Um, no, I think it has more to do with uh, pedigree. Manil, uh, Imelda Marcos was trying to make, to put Manila on the international conference and tourism map. And that requires tourist sites. And Intramuros was there a huge opportunity wasted. 
And so she put it up. Of course, it also uh, is a matter of uh, pedigree, right? this idea to be associated with the past ruling class. We also see that played out in Vigan. But uh, I don't think that the reconstruction of the wars of Intramuros, unlike the CCP, can be considered a glorification of the dictatorship because the wars of Intramuros carry so much more, whereas the CCP carries nothing else. Uh, thank you for that. I, I read a comment earlier from Mylene Lissing, but basically her comment is, is this hubris, this intentional destruction of memory, is this limited to human beings as a species or is, is this kind of behavior evident also in other animals? <laughs> um, animals don't have culture. Uh, and uh, architecture, history, those are expressions of culture. And therefore, you wouldn't find it in the animal kingdom, quite simply. Where there is no art, there is no erasure of art or history. And Thank animals you. may use tools, but they don't have art. That we know for sure. Thank you for that. Uh, Yeah, uh, regarding that, Raul has a comment. Isn't the destruction of memory of previous students just normal in nature? New alpha lions, for example, usually kill the offspring of defeated alpha. So <laughs> just, just, a, just a follow up comment on that. It, anyway, so. Sorry, um, is that, was that a question? No, that was just a comment. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's just say uh, this is something which has been going on since antiquity. For example, in ancient Egypt, uh, when uh, Pharaoh fell from power when he died, and for some reason his successors didn't want to uphold his memory, his uh, memory was systematically erased. Take, for example, the Parao Echnaton, uh, Ahmed Aton, uh, who was the Parao immediately before Tut and Amun. He revolutionized uh, Egyptian society, and it was Tut and Amun who restored ancient Egyptian religion and culture to what it was before Akhenaton. And for that reason, Akhenaton was considered a heroic and a very bad guy, and therefore his memory was systematically erased. His name was systematically chiseled out of all the monuments that he had erected. It was eradicated from all official uh, documents that he had uh, signed or written. In fact, so sorrow was the eradication of his memory that it was not until the 1930s or 40s, I'm not quite sure, that actually this parao was rediscovered. Damnatio memoare, erasure of memory. Damnatio memoare can be given its own category or does it, uh, can it be classified within the six? Because it deals only with a specific person, not with a group of people, not with an idea or a religion. It just deals with one person, erasing the memory of that person. So can yeah. that be considered a separate category from the six? Well, when I, when I drew up the categories, that was basically to give uh, examples. No? This list is in no way uh, considered to be complete or comprehensive. It's just to showcase the most obvious and well-known examples of uh, the manipulation of history. So if you want to consider uh, another category, that would probably be appropriate. We are only dealing with the most glaring examples. Uh, earlier you said that there's iconoclasm that exists from be between versus rather, versus one religion over the other. Can iconoclasm exist within the same religion? Yes, absolutely. That's what I pointed out earlier. For example, during the Reformation, when uh, Protestants stormed Catholic churches in order to destroy the images of saints. Uh, if you go to Europe today, you'll find many uh, sculptures without heads. These are dating back to the time of the Reformation, when those statues were systematically destroyed by Protestants because they were deemed as idolatrous. It also played out during the time of the Byzantine Empire, when uh, one group of uh, Orthodox Christians uh, smashed icons 
because they saw them as a, a blasphemy. They were not considered to be in line with the teachings of uh, the Bible. So they were destroyed. Others believed that icons were okay, so they put them back. And the next wave of iconoclasts put them down again. It perfectly happens within religions as well. Um, thank you for that. We have a comment from Margot. Uh, her, uh, question rather. Should treasures looted or sold or became spoils of war that are located in museums be returned to the original, uh, sorry, be returned to the originating countries? What if those countries could not sustain keeping them or not know how to appreciate them? So there's this, uh, just to share this, this joke. Uh, tell us uh, what you think is British, but it's not actually British. The answer <laughs> is the contents of the British Museum. <laughs> That's very <laughs> so true. This is a very, very controversial debate. This has been going on yeah. for ages. You know, think of the Elgin marbles that are housed in the British Museum and the Greeks have been asking them back for decades to no avail to date. Half of African art is probably in the British Museum, probably more <laughs> in the British Museum than on the African continent itself. Um, should it be returned? It's a good question. For example, if uh, a lot of those artworks that are now in the museums in Germany, France, and Britain had been returned to Afghanistan, had been returned to Syria or to Iraq, much of them would be destroyed today. They would have fallen victim to ISIS. So in a way, the fact that some of them were abroad actually saved them from destruction. Now, does it mean that they should stay there forever? Not necessarily. Uh, during World War II, a lot of uh, artifacts that were taken from Nigeria by the colonialists were destroyed when uh, museums in Germany were bombed. So where they are best kept in terms of their safety, security, is debatable. Is it proper to return them? Uh, it's a very difficult question. Some of them were uh, stolen. Yes, you can say that. Others were exported legally. For example, all the artifacts that were taken from Troy were exported with permission from the then Ottoman Empire. So it was there was nothing illegal about it. Others are the boots of war. You can debate that. Um, on the other hand, is it not better for an artwork to be displayed in Europe to educate them about, say, African civilization, rather than Africa, where we know about our history and we do not need to be educated that we were civilized? In a way, they may be more useful in the West than in Africa itself. Like I said, it's a, it's a very, very tricky question. We can talk yeah. on for this. That, that alone would uh, merit another lecture in its own right. Yeah. We have a uh, question from Antonia Boitis. So, were there any cases of iconoclasm during the Battle of Manila in 1945? Not that I know of because iconoclasm is tied to religious beliefs. And as far as I know, um, World War II really was not about uh, religion primarily, but about political dominance. So um, I stand to be corrected, but to my knowledge, no. We have a question from Al Malik. Uh, feel free to answer, or if you have, uh, have something to say. So. What is your opinion with the ongoing reconstruction of post-war Marawi in Mindanao? I do not know about the exact plans that they have in mind. Um, there's really very little I can say about it because uh, I'm not privy to it. Um, I would need some background information to give a useful answer to that question. Sorry. I do, not, I, I do know that Marawi doesn't contain much in terms of heritage. Yes, there were many mosques. There were also, I think, uh, I think there was also a Torogan nearby. But most of the structures in Marawi, uh, most of the mosques, date from the post-war period. So whether they are historically valuable is a matter of, well, let's say, interpretation. Certainly, Marawi should be rebuilt. That's uh, no question. Um, in terms of heritage, I don't think there's much to say to start with. Uh, thank you for that.
Uh, we have a question from Santiago Cruz regarding the preservation and reconstruction, which is considered more ideal. Moreover, in the case of reconstruction, could it be contested that it is something of an imitation involved rather than depicting its actuality in the sense that they're copies of the original building, yet would there still be value in there? In imitation? Uh, sorry, uh, John, could you repeat the question? It was a bit choppy here. Sorry. Uh, regarding preservation and reconstruction, which is considered more ideal between the two? Moreover, in the case of reconstruction, could it be contested that it is something of an imitation rather than depicting the actual history and in the sense that they're just being copies of the original? So aren't we creating a false history? With that? Very, very good question. I, I raised that earlier. <clears throat> well, to start with, uh, international norms require that you do not demolish a historic structure in order to reconstruct another one. Uh, international standards also require that when you reconstruct a building, you do so based on sound scientific evidence, not on conjuncture. No? Reconstruction should never be based on speculation, how you would like to have had it but rather on sound scientific or archival evidence, how a structure looks like. Now, are we falsifying history? Well, if I, if I demolish the uh, cultural symbols of a community, I'm manipulating history, trying to pretend that uh, they have never been there and that they have no right to be there. If therefore the community reconstructs their cultural markers, in order to reassert their right to the place, they are also manipulating history. And so we are both manipulating history. So uh, from that angle, both are equally valid. Now, when you reconstruct a building, there are basically two different ways of looking at it. You can say the building is the idea. A building is an idea, how something should be designed, how it should look like. And the other idea is that a building is actually a physical artifact. No? And the debate is basically about the two. Is, an, is a building primarily an idea or is it a physical relic? If you see a building as an idea, you have no problems reconstructing it because what counts is the design, the concept, the idea. But if you go by the relic, then a reconstruction is a no-no because you would see it as fake. How you evaluate that varies from culture to culture. In the West, we have a strong emphasis on authenticity, which means uh, the relic, the physical artifact is important and should be preserved. And therefore, reconstructions are seen critically. I mean, they happen left and right, but from a scientific point of view, from the scientific community, they see them rather critically, especially historians. In Asia, it's a little bit different because in Asia, uh, in many countries, the architecture, the traditional architecture is not as solid, rock solid as in Europe. Now think of countries like Japan or ours, where buildings are rebuilt every 50, 100 years you know, because they rot away, they are eaten up by termites. So we have much less of an ideological problem with reconstruction. You know, think of the Japanese who rebuilt the Ise Shrine every, I think, about 10 years but uh, do not change the look for the past thousand years. Um, there are different traditions of uh, viewing this. My personal take is if a building is very important to a community, there's no reason not to reconstruct this, provided there is sound scientific evidence. But um, it depends. In a country like Italy, where you have an abundance of heritage, it doesn't make much sense to make reconstructions. Italians have plenty of it. In a country like the Philippines, where there's much less built heritage remaining, I think one can be more generous and give more permission to reconstruct. Uh, regarding iconoclasm, you had mentioned earlier about destruction to achieve the iconoclast uh, goal. But can, is it uh, also possible that you can achieve that same goal by not destroying a building or a structure or a monument, but by rather, but rather by reinventing it. So it's the case of the obelisk in the center of the St. Peter's uh, Square, is that right? In Vatican, there's an obelisk there, Egyptian yeah. obelisk. 
and they just added the cross on top. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, like recon uh, conquering the pagan religion and the triumph of Christianity. Is that a form of iconoclasm? Uh, iconoclasm uh, pertains to destruction, to my knowledge. Therefore, a repurposing of a building would not be considered iconoclasm. I stand to be corrected if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding. Therefore, if you repurpose a church into a mosque or a mosque into a church or whatever, it doesn't fall under this category. By the way, it is very common to do so. Um, when Islam uh, took over much of Eastern Europe in the 14th to uh, 18th century, many churches were converted into mosques. Likewise, in the Reconquista, many mosques were converted into churches. Let's think, for example, the mosque of Cordoba and Sevilla, which today are the cathedral of Cordoba and Sevilla, or think of the Hagia Sophia, which started out as a Christian church, then was converted into a mosque, uh, sorry, into a mosque then became a museum, and recently has become a, a mosque again. Um, it's probably even more common to repurpose a building rather than to destroy it. Thank you for that. Unfortunately, we are, uh, everyone, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Thank you, everyone, for your comments and your questions. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to our 48th episode of Little Most Learning Sessions. Now, before we end, uh, Mr. Eric, would you like to recommend any literature for those who would like to pursue this topic further? Um. There's no specific literature that I have in mind that uh, cover this extensively. There's quite a lot of information about this on the internet, on the Wikipedia, uh, in the libraries. Um, so I, I don't have any particular structure to point out to, except perhaps our upcoming book. But that's another story. I hope it's okay. Feel free it, to it, promote it, your it, upcoming book. It, it, I hope ho hopefully it will be out this year. We have a book coming up, uh, myself and Dr. Fernando Schalteta. Uh, with Victor Vinida. Uh, this will be published by the uh, Ateneo de Manila University Press, hopefully this year. It was delayed by the ECQ and COVID-19. And mm. in that book, we will be discussing aspects like those which we have discussed today, like heritage and identity, the role of conflict and heritage. So it is covered in it. Uh, endangered uh, Splendor. Endangered, endangered Splendor. Endangered Splendor, the Architectural Heritage of Manila, 1571 to 1960. Hopefully this year has been delayed for many, many years. I hope it will come up finally. Yeah, it's supposed um, to be published in 2015. <laughs> don't, 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 don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. But, but, so but there's, much, there's much more. No? I mean, uh, the internet is full of interesting scientific and academic articles which cover this uh, topic. Uh, just look around, put in the keywords, heritage, identity, conflict, iconoclasm. You'll have plenty of uh, literature that will delve deeper into it. There's a lot and it is a fascinating topic to read about. Thank you, uh, Mr. Akedono, and thank you everyone. And uh, before I end this uh, episode, so uh, I'd like to promote our social media channels. The Intramuros Administration is available in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and in YouTube. And for those who missed our session today, if you came in late or if you totally missed it, don't worry because we're going to upload the, a recording of this session in our YouTube channel. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Also, I'd like to promote our page at the Google Arts and Culture. So we have digitized many of our museum collection. And if you missed going to our museums, feel free to go to our Google Arts and Culture page just key in Intramuros administration. And lastly, to promote our webinar tomorrow, so this will be our last session for 2020. So the episode number 41 for tomorrow, December 29, 3 p.m. Talatalaan, documenting the giant last, uh, sorry, documenting the giant lantern festival of San Fernando Pampanga towards a safeguarding plan of an, of an intangible cultural heritage. And joining us for tomorrow is Rafael Emmanuel Valencia Calo. Right, so uh, 
Sir Eric, would you like to say some final words before we finally part ways today? Just maraming salamat po and Happy New Year. And thank you too. Thank you everyone <laughs> for joining us and Happy New Year as well to you, thank you. and to your family and to everyone. And thank see you. you tomorrow. Thank you.